go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. Philadelphia fans were cut from a different cloth. Born into a brotherhood and bonded to our team for life. We believe anything is possible because we've witnessed the impossible. While we may be from different neighborhoods, come Sunday, we are one and we will be heard. Pondley Hockey, official partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. And it's the football playbook with your boy RIC in a place to be. Rick Saratella, tell it like it is when it comes to the 13 and 3 Philadelphia Eagles here on this Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Happy New Year. Uh, we were off yesterday on hiatus. So uh, welcome back to the big show, the global show. Big shout out to all our listeners, all the chat room people. And, um, you know, we're going to get jump started right into it today. Obviously, uh, developing story. If you were tuned into uh, the Monday night football game last night, then you know Damar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills suffered the cardiac arrest during the game. Very scary moment, just like many of you, just like many of the other hosts' reaction here on the Jacob Sports uh, YouTube network. Something I've never seen in the great game of football. Uh, obviously, a scary moment. And so the football community continues to. Uh, poor thoughts and prayers to Damar Hamlin, his family. I see the GoFundMe page with his um, foundation now is up to $3.6 million in donations. So the support continues to pour in. And we'll get into that as the show progresses. We'll keep an eye on the latest news. I know he was in stable condition at last check. So I haven't heard anything uh, since the uh, the statement released by the Buffalo Bills that I thought came out this morning. Been a long weekend, been a long day. Uh, we'll get into the Eagles. We'll get into um, the Saints game, which was ugly. We'll look ahead to the Giants game. We'll have Martin Frank from the Delaware News Journal coming up at 1030 a.m. Eastern. And I know you guys want to get into the Saints reaction. I know you want to get into uh, the coaching game plan and everything else, the injuries, Josh Sweat, Art McNally, by the way, uh, recently inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame this year in 2022. First NFL official passes away on New Year's Day. Uh, so we'll get that in as well. But, you know, anytime I get a chance to pop up my paisan, Paul Dottino from Giants.com, I had to do it Tuesday, as you know. We go behind enemy lines. We bring on the beat reporters. And in my opinion, there's really none better in the business than Paul Dottino. And he joins us now on the Football Playbook. Good morning, Paul. Thank you for your time today. Obviously, a somber moment last night. It's on everybody's mind here in the community. And uh, Happy New Year, by the way. Yeah, Happy New Year, Rick. Uh, you know, obviously what happened last night is something none of us in, in football have experienced before, unless, of course, you remember the Chuck Hughes incident with the Detroit Lions many years ago, the only NFL player who actually had passed away on the field, and, and he had suffered uh, a very similar situation. Let's hope that for the Bills' sake and, and the NFL community, uh, obviously Hamlin first and foremost, that there is a recovery here and that we're able to see him one day walk out and be with the Bills' teammates that uh, he so much loves and has a, a coin toss a ceremony. And, uh, you know, uh, bottom line is you just never expect anything like this, and, and it was certainly very shocking and stirring. Yeah, I mean, he had to be resuscitated on the field. Uh, very, very 
frightening moment there. And of course, uh, Brian Dable, Joe Shane, very strong ties to the Buffalo yeah. Bills organization. I did not see anything issued uh, by the Giants. Have you heard anything in terms of no, Dable? no? Uh, the Giants have not issued uh, any statement at all. Several of the uh, former Bills, as you know, guys like Hodgins, uh, Feliciano, uh, uh, Brita, are all part of the Giants' family right now uh, as part of this roster. So there is a very healthy Bills connection. The Giants did not issue any statements last night. But the Giants are off today. I do have some things to tape at the facility. I may run into them. But uh, at this point, I have not seen any reaction other than what has already been on Twitter and as you probably have seen, everyone from the NFL community from all over uh, the 32 teams and then some have certainly sent their prayers and well wishes. Yeah, no doubt about it. We're going to continue to keep an eye on the situation as it develops. And we hope for the best here for DeMar Hamlin and his family. Obviously, a lot of these Giants players and coaches, a former teammate of DeMar Hamlin. But, you know, they have to focus at the task at hand. Uh, it's been a while since the Giants have clinched a playoff spot, uh, Paul. And I, I hear the celebrations were getting a little bit wild in the locker room on a late night, uh, a toast of the town there in New York City. But it's just remarkable what Brian Dayball has done. I don't think I've spoken to you since the hiring. I know they got the right guy. And, and, and this weekend upcoming could determine the coach of the year sweepstakes. Now, I think the big question in Philadelphia that everybody wants to know are the New York Giants going to play their starters? Are they going to rest their starters? Is it going to be a wait-and-see process? I know Dayball came out and initially sounded like that the starters might go, and then he changed his tune and said we do what is best for the team. I think we're just speculating here, but what does your gut tell you, Paul? Well, Dable is one of those Belichick disciples who doesn't really like to show his cards, Rick. You, you understand that. That's the way all those folks are who come from that tree. So he's going to be evasive and general and avoid the question as much as he possibly can. We would hope to find out more in the next 48 hours. But based on what Dable has done so far in his first season with the Giants, I think what he's going to do, the guys who are healthy, of course, that's in quotations uh, going into the 17th game of the season. But the guys who are healthy outside of Daniel Jones – it would not surprise me if they play a quarter or maybe even a half. But anyone, and I mean anyone, who has got some bumps and bruises and is nicked up or has been dealing with things like a Saquon Barkley, like a Leonard Williams, like a guy like Dexter Lawrence who's been given load management days off sometimes at practice during the week, I expect all of those guys to be rested on Sunday to give them a second bye week so that the Giants can have as many of their healthy starters available and as many rehabbing starters available for the first-round playoff game. I want you to understand something, Rick, and you and, as well, and I both know this. There are some teams in the National Football League where the coaches will have more influence on players who are on the medical list than with other teams. The Giants are not that way. They've always been ultra conservative, medically speaking, and they always allow the team doctor to make the final call as to green light or red light for a player. Well, Dable goes even beyond that. From what I understand over the course of this season, the training staff makes recommendations to Dable. They don't sometimes even say green light or red light. They say, well, this could be a yellow. He rides with their recommendations. He has been one of the most agreeable, from what I understand, football coaches that a training staff could ever want to work with. He's very quick to take their suggestions, very quick to give players load management days during the week, on Sunday if necessary, and even there are times that he will not. For example, it was so nice in New Jersey last week for the weather, right? They practiced inside. They didn't practice outside before the Colts game. And one would say, why? It's 50-something degrees and sunny outside. Well, the grounds crew said to him, the field, believe it or not, is a bit too hard and a bit too frozen. You're running the risk of injury. He said, I don't want to do that to my players. We're going to practice inside of the field house. He is ultra, ultra conservative. And again, 
takes the trainer's suggestions to heart. With that in mind, I think you will see a lot of the Giants not play against the Eagles. Interesting stuff, Paul Dettino, Giants.com. Nobody's got their finger on the pulse better when it comes to Big Blue. We're so honored to have him here uh, getting the 411 behind enemy lines this upcoming week. And I agree. I think the Giants are going to try and rest this t- uh, team. I think they are banged up. And what you're saying about Dable, I had known about he was very into the analytics and data element. So it makes sense that he would kind of be leaning towards this kind of modern um, mentality when it comes to head coaching. I I think Dable's a pretty young guy, relatively speaking, in terms of uh, head coaching uh, candidates out there. You're seeing the NFL get younger. You're seeing more guys in the front office value data analytics, leaning on the medical staff. Nick Sariani, I think, has also kind of taken a page from that playbook as well. Um, you know, it's well, funny. Well, we understand the, the Giants over the last decade have been one of the most, if not the most injured team in the National Football League. Dable's no fool. You know, he comes in here and he sees that. He knows how badly this year's team has been ravaged with injury. So if he's ever going to error, it's always going to be on the side of the medical staff. No, and, and you know, I'm curious, Paul, because – if anybody can remember this, it's you. In the past, I can't recall, you know, when the Giants wrapped up a number one seed, but resting starters can go one or two ways. It could be very beneficial. And in the case of a Saquon Barkley, I think, yeah, he could use a week off to regain some strength. In the case of a Daniel Jones, like he's been playing at such a high level and minimizing turnovers and being very efficient like you take a week off, you take your foot off the gas pedal, and then, you know, there could be a little rust there. Do you recall Giants teams in the past that have wrapped up the number one seed? Have they rest guys? Has it panned out? Do you think it could backfire? What is the Paul Dettino take on resting versus playing? You know what, Rick? I don't think the history books are really relevant here because this is a Giants team that has spent so much gas and so much effort and whittled through away through so many injuries to get here that guys who are nicked up, let's not kid ourselves. The Giants are going to be an underdog going into the playoffs. You know, they're going to be the number six seed. Now, in my my perspective of things, I certainly want them to play the number three Minnesota Vikings, a team they just gave heck to two weeks ago, and I believe outplayed, and if not for some sloppy mistakes, would have won that game. I like their chances in a rematch against the Vikings team right now that has a banged-up offensive line. But I do think the national perception is the Giants are going to be heavy underdogs. And with their nine wins so far this season, eight of them by one score or less will will say, well, you know, they're kind of fortunate to be here. They're going to be a one-and-done team. The, The Giants are not competing for a number one seed. You know, if you're that good, Maybe you can look at this thing differently. But the Giants have had to struggle, scratch and claw for everything that they've gotten. And they've got guys whose gas tank is virtually on empty. That makes this situation totally different than anything in the past. And I believe that Dable needs to be smart and needs to take those warning signs from his training staff and follow them. Because this team does have a chance in the first round to do some damage. I I think they're playing pretty damn good ball over the last three weeks of the season. And when, when you, when you go into the playoffs on a bit of a roll, you absolutely enhance your chances. No, I would agree. I think the Vikings is a very winnable matchup and the giants are playing good ball entering the big dance. So anything's possible once you get there, as you know, Paul. So uh, I guess it will be a lot of Tyrod Taylor. I can't recall seeing him much this year. I know he's banged up earlier in the season. <laughs> is it going to speaking of the Buffalo bills? Will it be Tyrod in there or? Yeah, I expect you'll see quite a bit of Tyrod Taylor. I think if Daniel Jones plays a series or two, that would be it. In my book, I think they will plays it like he would the last exhibition game, you know, where if you do play your quote, starters, they're out of there in a hurry. But again, I think any of the guys who the training staff lists as being low on gas, they don't play. Daniel Jones, I will say this. The danger of the rust factor that you alluded to a few minutes ago, I don't think that really is a factor for the Giants because of how focused they are. This is a team 
that is incredibly consistent and has shown throughout the season in terms of their preparation. And they follow the coach's lead. Dable says you don't get too high, you don't get too low. You prepare the same way every single day, regardless of the situation and the circumstances. They usually don't tell the players on Thursday at the earliest as to who may or may not be in the lineup. They're a very matchup-oriented team. They don't just keep the same uh, snap counts and same schemes every week. They match up more so than even other teams do, especially on defense. And so they force their guys to be extremely consistent in their prep. I'll give you an example. Daniel Jones spent a full day at work yesterday with his playbook working on film and working on tape. Now, he probably doesn't know if he's even going to see one snap against the Eagles. But on Monday, he's busting his butt, doing what he's done every single Monday for the entire season, studying up for the game. So is Daniel Jones really going to be uh, uh, lacking focus if he doesn't play a snap against Philly? I don't think so. This guy's got a laser on, on the heart of the matter. He won't he won't be uh, distracted at all by getting a week off if that's what they decide to do. And I think most of the Giants are the same way. All right, we're going to continue to see what the Giants decide to do. You know, uh, Eagles fans thought this game was going to be meaningless from a Philadelphia standpoint. Turns out to be a meaningless game from the Giants vantage. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, Paul. I got to get you out of here. But one thing I wanted to ask you about was – uh, what was your takeaway? Kayvon Thibodeau, who I was very high on when we did our draft coverage uh, back in April, he's right. been playing well. Obviously, the Nick Foles, I mean, we just saw a scary incident with DeMar Hamlin, the sack against Mick, Nick Foles. I saw uh, Jeff Saturday came out and had some very critical words for Kayvon Thibodeau, the, the snow angel celebration. And I guess he went even further after the play to the sideline and did the night night time uh, to Nick Foles? Any takeaways or thoughts there? I'm going to give you a generic thought because it doesn't just apply to Thibodeau. It applies to all NFL players. I'm an old school guy. I would do away with all the celebrations. Okay. I'm okay with the spike in the end zone. You know, Homer Jones didn't want to get fined for throwing the ball into the stands. So many years ago, Homer Jones invented the spike so that he wouldn't hurt in the pocketbook. And so after he would score a touchdown, he'd spike the ball. You had Elmo Wright, you know, with the crazy uh, crossover at his knees after he scored a touchdown. There have been a few minor celebrations that, in my mind, are okay. But I don't dig all of the choreography. The Radio City Music Hall Rockette celebrations that we are now seeing that are more than one or two players. No, it's the whole team, the whole unit. They got to pose for a, a picture. They got to make like they're rowing a boat up a stream. I'd get rid of all of it. You know, Jim Brown used to give the ball to the referee after he scored a touchdown and said, make it like you've been there before. Well, that's me. I don't mind a fist pump. I don't mind a guy slapping each other on the butt or a high five or, or a hug or even a pump fist, you know, to the air because maybe you want to pay tribute to, to a lost relative or something. Keep the damn thing to a minimum. I'm against 90% of the celebrations on the football field. And that's how I feel about it. This has nothing to do with Thibodeau. Obviously, mm -hmm. any anything that he did would have been, uh, you know, banned by, by my old school mentality anyway. Yeah, I think we're both probably – more old school than most there, Paul. I tend to agree with you. I wasn't going to go down that road because I thought, you know, people probably think that I'm outdated, but I agree with you. I'm watching the college football playoffs. I see a guy, he, he, he has a pass deflection in the end zone to prevent a touchdown. He's celebrating the dance to hold five minute celebration. Next play he's giving up a touchdown to lose the game. So <laughs> I'm with you. I think it's gotten a little bit out of control too much. And so I know Make I think it's know, simple. It's simple, Rick. Keep it to a minimum. If you have a, a momentary burst of emotion because of a play you made, no one's going to say you have to stand there with your hands by your side and walk to the sideline. We're not saying that. Hell, Phil Sims would throw a touchdown pass and give a fist pump. That's fine. That's minimal. That's a momentary burst of emotion. It's all this choreography that I am totally against. Yeah, no, I think – 
I think, you know, it's a special teams tackle now we're celebrating. So I think it's getting a little bit too much. But, hey, let me ask you this. I, 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 I'm sorry to keep you so long, but Franco, okay. Harris, Franco Harris, Fort Dix, New Jersey, the Italian yeah. Army, uh, you, you know, you, 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 I know, have seen him play. Uh, can you just shed some light on what Franco Harris meant to the NFL legacy, one of the all-time greats? Well, not just one of the all-time greats in terms of talent and production, but how about one of the all-time greats in terms of being a first-class individual? How, how about we talk about that for a second? Because there's not a there's not a guy outside of Jim Brown who was upset when Franco was attacking his career all-time rushing record who would ever say anything derogatory about Franco Harris. Universally loved for many reasons, not just a class individual, an unselfish individual, and a guy who always put his best foot forward. But, you know, Jim Jim came up with, well, he's always looking to run out of bounds. He's never looking to take that extra hit. He's never looking to lower his shoulder. And Franco's take was, well, durability is more important because I know my team needs me the rest of the game. My team needs me next week. They'd be the rest, they need me the rest of the season. I'm not doing them any good if I'm hurt and I'm not available. And so, you know, I never took Jim Brown's criticism of, of Franco to have any water or weight. I mean, if it's third and an inch, yeah, you better lower your shoulder to get the first down. But but there were many other times that, that you know, Franco did what was prudent because he knew how valuable he was to his team. Let's face it, until the emergence of Franco Harris, the Steelers weren't rattling off four Super Bowl championships in six years. Yeah, so, 1972, that uh, uh, Franco Harris draft. And then two years later, they had one of the most historic draft classes of all time. No doubt. And they won four Super Bowls right there in the 70s on the back of the one, Franco Harris, who uh, was a thousand yard rusher as a rookie. And they didn't play as many games back then. And uh, if you take his first 10 years, I mean, you could stack them up against anybody. Uh, Rick, I smile. Every time I go to the Pittsburgh airport, I, I during my sports casting travels, I have to go to Pittsburgh, you know, every year. And every time I see the statue of Franco catching the ball from the immaculate reception that is in the Pittsburgh airport, it gives me a good feeling inside because he was a true ambassador for pro football and for the city of Pittsburgh. One of the all-time greats, as are you, Paul Dettino, one of the all-time greats. By the way, uh, I hope the holidays treated you well. How many meatballs did the Dottino uh, family put down over the past week? Or two? Uh, you, you know, I kind of took it a little bit easy. I'm just glad you said all-time greats instead of old-time greats. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Paul, we appreciate all the hard work you've done. And um, I believe you are the longest tenured New York Giants beat writer, are you not? Well, I mean, 40 years. Uh, 40 years on the beat, I I'm going to do at least 50. And after I do 50, I'll probably want to do at least 10 or 20 more. <laughs> it's It's been a blast, Rick. And, and I, I the fire burns. I enjoy it. I love what I do. And, uh, you know, when you have these NFC East games, even ones like this Sunday, which probably don't carry a lot of clout, it's still fun. No, absolutely. And I always love uh, crossing paths with you, seeing you out there and, uh, of course, listening to you on the NEC Northeast Conference calls as well. I'm sure we'll be talking sooner rather than later, Paul. And uh, thank you so much for checking in on the Football Playbook. Always good to be with you, Rick, one of the great draft gurus of the National Football League. Stay well. Thank you so much. That's Paul Dettino, really uh, one of the first-class acts. He talks about Franco Harris being a first-class person. And I agree, that was one of my most enjoyable uh, interviews with Franco Harris and Paul Dettino, a first-class individual, in, in addition to being the best uh, writer on the beat for the New York Giants, Paul, he'll shoot you straight now. Uh, he doesn't pull any punches, and that's what I like about him. And he's been around the block, as you can tell, a fountain of knowledge. And uh, I, I, uh, I have become a regular, <laughs> believe it or not, guys, on the Giants.com. When it comes to draft season, of course, we had John Schmelk on a couple weeks ago, and I always hop on. With John and Paul, we talk NFL draft, what it all means. And, hey, uh, we got the chat room people out there uh, living it up, getting down on it. We're going to have Martin Frank from the Philadelphia uh, Delaware Journal News coming up in just a few minutes. want to give a shout-out 
to everybody who came out to the tailgate takeover on Sunday, by the way. I'll talk more about it later on the show. Philly 559, I see in the chat room. It was good to catch up. Uh, Doc, you know, I'm sure he's pulling some teeth right now listening to the show. It was great to see everybody out there. Uh, we are going to call out a few individuals who said they were coming and did not show. <coughs> oh, Cam's Razor, I'm talking to you. Um, but, hey, no, appreciate all the comments. Paul Mancini, Davey Boy, Homeowner BBQ, welcome to the show. Uh, you know, listen, I get it with the celebrations. I'm not trying to take the fun out of football. The Nick Foles, after I watched it again, it was a little bit disturbing. You know, somebody should have did something. And I just think, you know, considering what we saw this week between DeMar Hamlin, Nick Foles, some of the stuff we saw with Tua, I mean, let's just make sure the guy's okay <laughs> before we're over there dancing and celebrating over him. That's all. And, uh, yeah, Paul Mancini, born in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Kevin Savard, I see it. James Stella. Uh, Jalen Hurts is the MVP. He's proven it by not playing, I think. And, yeah, we got a little clean shaven with it. I was out at the tailgate. We were grimy with it. We were getting it in. And I got, I got to thank you, man. I can't tell you what it means to me with some of the compliments you guys paid me at the tailgate takeover. It's been uh, su such a humbling experience to listen to the compliments and what this show has become in our 84th edition here on the football playbook. And we'll get into some of that later on hour two of the show, Josh sweat. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that was a scary incident, which has kind of been, I don't want to say forgotten, but uh, with the NFL community focused on DeMar Hamlin, uh, we are going to continue to monitor the situation. Hopefully we have an update here soon. I see his GoFundMe uh, foundation page, you know, I checked this morning. It had just gone over $3 million. I checked uh, again right before we went on air. It was $3.6 million. So the money and support is uh, flooding in DeMar Hamlin's uh, way. Hopefully he pulls through. And just a very scary moment last night. If you did not see it, Monday Night Football, Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin had a cardiac arrest on the field, collapsed, was rushed to the hospital University of Cincinnati Hospital. We're continuing to monitor the situation. Alexander Freeman, uh, buckle up. All you guys out there in the chat room, uh, get down on it. We've got Eagles talk for the next 90 minutes or so. Appreciate your patience. Paul Dettino, Tuesday. It's uh, typically a day off for the beat writers. So uh, had an opportunity to pop up Paul and he was worth every second of it. Now, we turn the page back over, focus on the Philadelphia Eagles. Hey, if you watched that game on Sunday, a lot of what we discussed throughout the week last week came true. And I've been listening to the talking heads. I've uh, been listening to all the shows here on the network, the post game, everything else. Love it. One thing I don't hear enough of, people giving the New Orleans Saints some credit. This is not a bad football team. And I'm going to get into that with Martin Frank, Delaware News Journal, right after the break. Smash that like button, and uh, we'll see you here in two minutes. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to ocean. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Number one, Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downing Town is rolling back prices for a December to remember. For a limited time, you can own, not lease, brand new 2023 Jeep Wranglers for only $39.95 or $339 per month. New Rams starting at only $39.95 or new Ram 1500 Bighorn Crew Cabs $189 per month. Zero Down can deliver. Get the price you want, the selection you need, and the VIP treatment you deserve. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downing Town, big finish sales event.
know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. With Seth Joyner. I knew that they had a running game. Derek Gunn. He has put in the effort. Devin Caney. Had we not won the Super Bowl, what would we be saying? And Mike Missanelli. Well, you know how Philly is. Post game, now streaming on the 6ABC family of apps. Back at it again here on the Football Playbook Part 84 edition on this Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Happy New Year to you all out there. And uh, we're here the day after uh, the Monday night football game that brought us a tragedy in DeMar Hamlin. He was uh, rushed to the University of Cincinnati uh, Hospital after suffering cardiac arrest on the field had to be resuscitated. Uh, Just a reminder of how minuscule football and this show really is in the grand scheme of things. But hey, we're here weekdays, Monday through Friday, 10 to 12, to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles, the National Football League and football universe. And so we'll continue to monitor the DeMar Hamlin situation. Uh, We are sending out Lots of thoughts and prayers uh, to the family of the one Damar Hamlin. But let's continue to keep the show moving. You just heard from Paul Dettino, Giants.com. We went behind enemy lines and got the Giants perspective for the upcoming Eagles matchup on this Sunday. Uh, A lot at stake. And here to talk about it is Martin Frank, Delaware News Journal, one of the best Eagles writers in the business. Good morning. Happy New Year, Martin. How are you today? Happy New Year to you, Rick. And uh, yeah, I'm Doing all right. I mean, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head with the Damar Hamlin situation. I mean, it makes kind of like what today, you know, today is all about pretty insignificant compared to, you know, the real life and death situation with, with you know, the Bill's safety and, you know, thoughts and prayers with him. And, you know, it, it kind of hit home a little bit because, you know, Sunday the Eagles had you know, a scare of their own, you know, when Josh Sweat um, went down and and you can see that he wasn't moving his legs for several minutes and, you know, the worst thoughts go through your mind and and you hope that everything is okay. And fortunately, and fortunately for Josh, I mean, you know, the reports are good. He's released from the hospital. He was removing all his extremities and, you know, you just you know, we just kind of wait and see like when he'll be able to play again. But, you know, I mean, that that seemed significant at the time. But then, you know, what happened last night made it even, you know, made that even, you know, relatively insignificant. You know, that guy's tomorrow was battling for life and stuff. You know, he was in cardiac arrest and CPR. And God, I just hope everything turns out OK for him. Yeah. I mean, they literally had to bring him back to life on the field and you're absolutely right we'll get into the josh sweat injury and maybe even discuss the nick Foles hit as well which was another scary scene uh from the national football league weekend uh you know i i do have to get into this eagles team though martin and there's so much to get into there's so many layers of the onion to peel back here obviously a disappointing performance for a second consecutive week against the Saints, who, you know, I I did not underestimate this team. This was a team mathematically still alive for the playoffs, coming in hungry. They had playoff expectations coming into the season. Oh, by the way, uh, they got back Chris Olave, and they they got back Marcus uh, Latimer, uh, some pretty good uh, 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 players there uh, to inject into the mix. But 
you know, I was one of the few, Martin, who thought, you know, Menchu Mania here is going to be short-lived this year in Philadelphia. I was one of the few who did not think Menchu played all that well against the Dallas Cowboys. And he had another three turnovers again this past week against the Saints. Six turnovers in two weeks, which is why I really felt like this was the week to go back to Miles Sanders, feed him the rock, lean on his career year, alleviate some of the pressure from a Gardner Minshew, and it just never came. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot to peel back, like you said, with that. Um, and and I kind of like point to the difference between, you know, Minshew and Jalen Hurts on, on those first two Eagles series. I mean, they went three and out on the first four series, but the first two in particular, you know, the first one um, – Minshew gets sacked on the first two plays. It's third and 16, you know, completes a short dump off pass. The Eagles punt. Uh, the second one, he got sacked. He threw incomplete. Again, third and 15 or whatever, short pass, and they punt. And I think the difference is, obviously, like in the first two plays on the first series, you know, Hertz escapes from that kind of pressure. You know, he runs for maybe 10 yards, gets a first down. The Eagles still have the ball. You know, and then Miles Sanders gets worked in, you know, and and they're moving down the field and they probably score. Instead, you know, Minshew can't run like Hurts can. So they go three and out four straight times. Miles Sanders gets two carries in the first half. And I think, like, if you had Hurts in there, it's it's a lot different situation. They're controlling the ball a lot more. They're moving down the field. Sanders is getting his rushes, you know. They're throwing the ball to Devontae, uh, A.J. Brown, and Dallas Goddard. And and it's and it would be like a normal type of Eagles game that we've seen this year where they pretty much, you know, control the clock, control the ball. And, you know, they're probably winning the game pretty easily with, with Hurts in there. And, you know, you saw Sunday just like what the big drop-off is between Hurts and Minshew. And, you know, Minshew, like you said, Minshew against the Cowboys threw for 355 yards. But he also threw the two interceptions, you know, lost a fumble. Uh, Miles Sanders lost another fumble. And, you know, they put up 34 points, but they still lose because of all those turnovers. And, and this time, Minshew just was awful, and the Eagles couldn't do anything offensively, and, and that was the big problem. Yeah, and we're going to get into some of the arrogance of this coaching staff in just a second. But I want to stick on Miles Sanders here because I heard him post game. He downplayed the lack of touches. But then they asked him about his knee. He said, the knee feels great. He said, how did, how did it look to you? Look pretty good to me. So I got to ask you, Martin, like you mentioned the fumbles. I remember a couple weeks back, I think Sariani chewed, chewed him out on the sideline for leaving yards on the table. I know coming into the season, work ethic was kind of a topic of conversation. I got to ask, it seems to me, and you're there every day. I'm just looking here from my living room, but it seems like there's some kind of underlying, I don't know if he's, in the doghouse they don't have confidence in him or you know they just don't believe in the run game or is it d none of the above i don't know what does your gut tell you well it it is kind of interesting because it seems like sometimes they forget he's on the team you know because he he goes long stretches without touching the ball and you know maybe the knee was kind of an issue he wore a brace during the game something he'd never done in college or high school or in the nfl before um, and, it, you know, like you mentioned, he said after the game, and I was right there when he said it, like it didn't affect him at all. He got used to it and everything like that. So I just think the circumstances, like if the Eagles had gotten a few first downs, you know, if Hertz was in there like early in the game and they get, you know, he escapes pressure, they get a first down, they keep the ball, they work Sanders in a little bit more. I think it would have been a lot different than in the fact they're going, you know, three and out every time they fall behind. 10 nothing, then 13 nothing, and they start throwing the ball uh, like crazy because they have to start catching up. And, you know, the complexion of the game changed differently. I, I think Miles Sanders, I think their goal was to use Miles Sanders. They just never got any first downs because Gardner Minshew was awful. And, you know, by the time they started using them, they're already down 13 nothing. And to their credit, they kind of got back in the game and then Minshew threw that awful interception. And, that was pretty much it. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it was a bad decision not to get Miles involved. I thought you needed him to build up his confidence, to build up his rhythm heading into the playoffs. You know, even when Jalen comes back, 
he could be relegated to becoming more of a pocket passer. We just don't know yet. But that takes me back to the arrogance of this coaching staff. I mean, they made no adjustments from the Cowboys game to this one. They made no second half adjustments. I'll get into the defense in just a moment. But just sticking on the offense, Martin, like it was the same exact offense we've seen all season, minus the designed run calls. Did they really think they were going to go in there with the same offense, just replace the quarterbacks, and thought Gardner Menchu was was going to not skip a beat? Is that was that the kind of yeah? Thing? I think it, that's exactly what it was. I mean, and but think about it from this point of view. I mean, Jalen Hurts is your quarterback. He's getting all the reps in practice. He's the guy you designed this offense for because he's such a unique quarterback, you know, with his running ability, his able to his ability to throw that like you're not going to design like you're not going to throw out the whole game plan and redesign the offense for Gardner Minshew for one or two games that he's going to be in there for. Now, if if Hertz had suffered, a, you know, a season ending injury like, you know, Carson Wentz did back in 2017, then, yeah, you know. Minshew is going to be your long-term quarterback and you redesign things to better fit his strengths. So I don't know if I'd call it arrogance as much as the fact that, you know, this offense is designed for Jalen Hurts. This is what they practice every single day with Jalen Hurts taking every single rep. So yeah, you kind of like you tweak things here and there, but it's still basically the same game plan. It's still basically the same offense. You're not going to throw everything out and start all over with, you know, a guy who's your backup quarterback who's been here for two years, so he knows the system. I mean, it's not like, you know, he's never seen it before. Um, he just played poorly, and and the differences between him and Hertz were exposed, and that's why, you know, you have a star quarterback who's your starter and a backup who's not as good. I mean, it's like that pretty much for every other team. Um, the only situation is when – something like this happens and it's a one or two week injury, you know, with Hertz, you don't change a whole lot and you just, you know, you go with what you have and, you know, it, it didn't work obviously because now they're in the predicament that they're in where Jalen Hurts is probably going to have to play in what should have been a meaningless, you know, final game, but now means everything for the Eagles. Talking to Martin Frank, Delaware news journal. Okay. Fair enough. We won't use the word arrogance. Let me, try it, let me try it again, Martin, with Jonathan Gannon, because is he that naive to watch Dak Prescott shred him against zone coverage 24 out of 24 uh, and then come back and do the same exact thing again? I saw Fletcher Cox post game, which credit, he said nobody's in here hitting the panic button. Eagles still control their own destiny. But he was asked. Yeah. Maybe it was you. I don't know. They asked him what changed in the second half on defense and his response, he said nothing. So again, they didn't adapt or adjust from the Cowboys game to this week. They didn't adapt or adjust from the first half to the second half. To me, Martin, if if they go in to the playoffs doing the same damn thing, Jonathan Gannon for all the success, for all the kudos, accolades, the sack pack, all that stuff. At the end of the day, they do this again in the playoffs. They're going to be one and done. Like Jonathan Gannon could be the downfall. I just can't believe this guy makes zero adjustments from week to week, from first half to second half. He has the audacity to think that this bend and break defense, we're going to keep doing what we do, and the other team needs to adjust to us. Well, guess what, Jonathan Gannon? They adjusted, and you made no kind of uh, counter moves there. Am I, am I taking this too far, Martin? Or what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe I've got like rose colored glasses on or something. I don't, um, but like, you know, the first drive the Saints had, you know, they, they used up nine minutes. They went down the field and scored. I mean, that was, that was bad, obviously. Um, but like after that, I mean, it wasn't the Saints offense that killed the Eagles. It was the Eagles offense. Um, You know, they didn't score another touchdown. I mean, like late in the first half, um, you know, the Saints had the ball. um, I think it was uh, the Saints, like, could have scored pretty easily, and and the Eagles held them to a field goal. They kept it at 13-0, which was a two-score game. And, you know, the Saints' offense didn't do anything in the second half. They didn't score. Um, You know, the Eagles, 
you know, got back into the game. And then again, Minshew threw that awful interception that pretty much sealed it. But, um, you know, that's, that's what the Eagles defense is. I mean, you know, you kind of like the offense, the Eagles offense is predicated on the fact that they can, you know, eat up the clock if they want, you know, they can run the ball if they want, they can throw deep if they want, you know, it's all predicated on the offense outscoring the other team. I mean, it's not really predicating on the defense winning the game for them. So, you know, in a situation like this and the week before against Dallas, when, you know, the defense obviously wasn't good, you know, they needed the defense to be decent enough to not lose the game. And, you know, the defense lost the game against the Cowboys. I wouldn't say that was the case against the Saints. It was more the Eagles offense that pretty much blew it. No, to your point, I mean, you hold the team to 20 points, you expect to win, and the Eagles defense did bounce back in the second half and played pretty pretty good there. I just saw, you know, Dalton, it, it looked like his numbers, I, I forget what it was, but he was Yeah, he was, he was like, thir- he started off 13 for 13. His first incompletion was the interception to Josiah Scott. Um, you know, he, I think he completed like 85% of his passes, something like that. I mean, it wasn't great, but I mean, you know, they weren't, I think they had the one beat ball. Um, other than that, everything was pretty much underneath, you know, check down stuff. I mean, not saying they could have been the Eagles defense could have been better because they could have been, but you know, they were pretty much um in a space. They sacked him six times. I think uh they sacked Taysom Hill another time. You know, I mean, I don't think the defense in the second half especially was the problem. It was it was the offense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and the offense certainly did not hold up their end of the bargain. And, you know, one last thing on the offense, since we went back that direction, the the cadence, uh, again, for the second week, they had a lot of false starts. Is that just yeah. not being familiar? I mean, they are practicing throughout the week with Gardner Menchu, right? Is that just a fluke thing? Yeah. Just getting comfortable with his snap count? Like, what is – and I know – they were asked after the game, and they said there was nothing specific as to why it's happening, but there has to be some cause of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the Minshew factor was was definitely part of it. I mean, you know, they only had the last week, last two weeks where Minshew was taking the reps in practice. You know, before that, I mean, he's the scout team quarterback, and, you know, he's pretty much helping out the defense with, you know, setting up what the opponents might be doing. So, um you know, the starters aren't used to playing with Minshew. I mean, that's not an excuse because you got to be better than that. You can't have five or six false starts like the Eagles did against the Saints and everything. So, yeah, I mean, that's something they definitely have to clean up. I mean, that was that was a big factor. I mean, the holding call, the uh, quote-unquote holding call on Landon Dickerson was awful. That negated um, Kenny Gainwell's touchdown run, you know, you take that's a four point swing right there. So when the Eagles score that second touchdown, you know, they're actually, they should be ahead 14 to 13 instead of down 13 to 10. And maybe the rest of that half goes differently because of that. Um, but yeah, the penalties were, were a big problem and, and it's kind of reared its head a few times, you know, in, in their losses and stuff. And that's something they got to clean up. And, you know, if Hertz is back in there this week as, pretty much uh, I would expect him to be. Um, I would think that would kind of take care of itself to some extent. Yeah, let's talk about Jalen Hurts, uh, his availability. You know, I had Coach John D. Filippo on the show on Friday, who was a college quarterback in his own right, and he actually suffered the same exact injury as Jalen Hurts, a grade two AC sprain in the throwing shoulder. And he said it's really just a, a pain tolerance type of situation right um he said he could have played you know they were not trying to clinch a playoff spot and 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 they were playing meaningless games so he did not return from the injury but he did say after a couple weeks like if they needed him to play he could have probably done it um i'm assuming jalen hurts is gonna go the question becomes martin is this a he plays the whole game he plays until the win is sealed he plays the first half he plays to be determined. Any inkling, any idea in terms of how they're going to move forward with Jalen Hurts on week 17 or week 18? Um, my my guess would be that, you know, if he's going to play, he's going to play to win. And, um, you know, the only way the Eagles would take him out is if, you know, like you mentioned, if they have it pretty much locked up in the fourth quarter 
you know, then maybe you put in your reserves and stuff. But yeah, I mean, if they're going to put them out there on Sunday, which I assume they will, um, you know, it's going to be like full, full, full throttle. I mean, he's going to, I don't think they would hold anything back. I mean, if it's something they need to, you know, they need to win this game, then they're, they're going to use them. If not, then, you know, and I think what John Filippo told you is absolutely true. I mean, I've talked to some, you know, sources, uh, you know, athletic trainers, nobody who's dealt with, dealt with hurts, but people who have dealt with that kind of injury and, it, and it's a rest and rehab type of thing. So ideally for the Eagles, when hurts suffer that injury, you know, they would keep them out until the playoff game because then you have five weeks, um, you know, of just rest and rehab, you know, but three weeks is better than two weeks, you know? So they, yeah, he could have played, um against the saints and sirianni you know his quote was that he was close to playing you know the fact that he was back in practice and stuff like that so i mean sitting them out for that saints game you know made sense from that point of view because the more rest you can get the better but now that they need him i mean i would think that he would be able to play through it and you know the th the problem is you run the risk like if he gets tackled again like he did against the bears you know then possibly it's, you know, you, you're pretty much back in the same situation going into the playoffs where he's not quite 100%. So, you know, you're taking a risk, but I think it's one the Eagles kind of have to take now because the difference between getting that number one seed and, you know, the Cowboys beating the Commanders and the Eagles losing to the Giants, you're the wild card. You're going to Tampa Bay mm. to play Tom Brady, even though you got the 13 wins. I mean, it could pretty much all – blow up in smoke so yeah i mean he's he's yeah. probably gonna play because of that and you know you just hope that he comes out of it okay you know they win the game they get the week off you know the next week so he gets to rest again yeah suddenly there's a lot on the line home field advantage the path mm -hmm. can run through philly they can stumble all the way down to five then they got to win three yeah. games instead of two i mean and, it's it it's a huge difference because if you're the number one seed, you get the bye, plus you get the two home games before the Super Bowl. But if you're the wild card, you get, you don't get the bye. You have to go on the road probably for all three playoff games to get yeah. to the Super Bowl. I mean, it's not impossible. Teams have done it, but, you know, I'd rather play two games at home than three games on the road. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, I'm sorry. And then you got to take into account, they got other guys who are banged up. I mean, people don't talk about Lane Johnson. I mean, that's a huge loss. And the more rest he can get, the better off he'll be. Avante Maddox, you know, he's got the toe injury that seems pretty serious. So, like, if they have to play next week in the playoffs, you know, first round on the road, I mean, I'm not sure that Lane Johnson or Avante Maddox are back yet, you know. So, Correct. I mean, there are all those things you got to throw in there, like going into this last game. That's what makes this this last game against the Giants huge. I mean, really huge. Yeah, I mean, the good news is they do control their own destiny, win, and the number one seed is yours. And I'll ask you your take on what you think the Giants will do. But since you brought up injuries, let me ask you, let's start off with Lane Johnson. I am going to consider – Anything Lane Johnson gives us in the playoffs is bonus. I mean, that's a really yeah. significant injury. Are you comfortable? Did you see enough out of Driscoll that you're going to leave him in there at right tackle moving forward? Is that how the Eagles are going to go into the playoffs there? Well, I mean, you got to look at the Lane Johnson injury two different two ways. You know, the fact that, you know, and he's probably – as tough a player as there is in the NFL for putting off surgery and trying this, you know, trying to play through this injury. Cause I, I can only imagine how much pain he must be, be in with a torn abdominal muscle. But the fact that like he first suffered the injury, I think it was against the giants on December 11th. And then it flared up again, two weeks ago. Um, I mean, two weeks later, you know, against the Cowboys kind of means that, you know, he's just going to play until the pain becomes too intense, which could happen at any point during the playoffs. So I think in that case, the Eagles need a, like a long term plan. Like, OK, you know, anything Lane, like you said, anything Lane Johnson gives us is a bonus, but it could happen again. What's our plan? So, you know, is Jack Driscoll at right tackle the, the best plan? I mean, I mean, it seems like the Eagles thought 
or think that he was, but he, he obviously didn't play very well against the Saints. I mean, Cam Jordan had three sacks, um, you know, pretty much lined up opposite of Driscoll. I'm not saying they were all Driscoll's fault, but, you know, I mean, Cam Jordan's no no dummy. I mean, you know, he sees, all right, well, if I would line up against Lane Johnson, I'm probably not going to get any sacks, so I'll go to the other side. Right. But, oh, Lane Johnson's not playing. I'll uh, I'll line up over here, over the over this guy. And, you know, he took advantage of that to his credit. And, you know, pretty much that will be the case, you know, with any opponent if Lane Johnson isn't in there. So, you know, I mean, I, I assume that by playing Driscoll right tackle, they thought he was the best alternative as opposed to maybe moving Jordan Melotta to right tackle and having uh, Andre Diller left. So, um you know, they, they're going to need a backup plan because I'm not sure that Lane Johnson's going to be able to make it through a playoff game, you know. And then, I mean, because it's an injury that needs surgery. And surgery, if he had surgery now, he, he'd be out for the rest of the season, including the Super Bowl. So, you know, I'm sure, like, the next time something like that happens, he's going to have to shut it down. So they're going to need to have a long-term plan in place for the playoffs and, you know, I, I wasn't terribly impressed with what I saw from Jack Driscoll, but maybe he's the best alternative they have. I mean, you know, he's played there before and everything. He's done okay. So I think they're going to have to cross their fingers and go with that if that's the case. Yeah, it could be risky business as they enter the playoffs here. I'm curious to see what they do there. And then also Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was eligible to be uh, off the injured reserve last week. They never opened up that 21-day window. This right. has big ramifications because we do have to wait and see on Avante Maddox. However, I think Chauncey Gardner-Johnson has a, 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 an opportunity here to kind of slide into that slot role, if healthy, uh, as we wait for Maddox to come back. What are, you, what are you hearing on Chauncey, and what do you think his role will be when he does come back? Well, here's the thing. I mean, they still haven't opened that practice window. So, um, you know, unless they do it today or tomorrow, like, I think his chances are pretty much nil that he's going to play on Sunday against the Giants because, I mean, obviously he's been out since November so or uh, the beginning of December, so, you know, he needs to get back into game shape. So you're looking at the playoffs for him to return. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, I think obviously if, if Avante Maddox still isn't ready to return in time for the playoffs, they're going to – I would think their best option would be to put uh, Chauncey Garner Johnson back in the slot, which is what he played for three years in New Orleans. And then, you know, have Reed Blankenship start at safety next to Marcus Epps. You know, you got Kayvon Wallace in there, you know, and if Gardner Johnson, you know, isn't strong enough to play an entire game, you still have Josiah Scott who can back him up and spell him for some, some plays here and there. But, you know, the fact that like his practice window hasn't been opened yet, I mean, it's kind of like a pretty bad sign that he's not going to be ready definitely this Sunday and and maybe not even, you know, probably not even until the playoffs. And another reason why the Eagles need to win on Sunday to get that by so they get an extra week of practice and, you know, get another key guy back because uh, if they had to play right away after that, you know, the following week in Tampa, I think that would be a problem for Chauncey Gardner Johnson to be ready for that one, too. Yeah, we'll have to see what the CAT scan tells us this week on Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. I know he only played 13% of the snaps this year in the slot. Last year with the Saints, though, it was 70%. People forget he did it at Florida as well in terms of playing that nickel role. Okay, Martin, yeah. I know uh, we're keeping you a little bit over time here. We'll kind of take the next question as a combo package. Josh Sweat, obviously you alluded to it at the top of the segment. What is his short-term outlook, long-term outlook, and – could the trickle down effect be uh, a cameo by Robert Quinn? Because I think he's also eligible to come off. He the, is the IR. So yeah. what the uh, Robert Quinn return to the roster. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely possible. I mean, I think you know, ideally, um, the Eagles probably would have stashed Robert Quinn on IR for the rest of the year and you know not brought him back. But yeah, if if Josh Sweat isn't going to be able to play, um, and you know, we won't probably won't know anything until like tomorrow or Thursday um, when they return to practice because today's the player's day off. But, um, you know, obviously the first thing with Josh Sweat is it was a scary injury and you want to make sure he's okay. You know, he can function normally and stuff, which I kind of get the sense that that is the case. Um, and then you start wondering, okay, can he get back and, you know, ramp back up and everything like that. So um, I don't know. Uh, 
per se, like if he's going to be ready to play on Sunday, I mean, I would think that would be kind of a stretch, but you know, again, in the playoffs. And if that's the case, then, uh, you know, they, they could definitely open the window on Robert Quinn and, and, you know, have him ready for Sunday. And if they need him like in the playoffs, you know, he'll be there. I mean, I think that's, that's definitely a possibility. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. The season is dwindling down. We're 40 days away to the Super Bowl. So the Eagles got to yeah. figure it out here in the next 40 days to get the deal, uh, seal the deal and get it done. Last one for you, Martin. Uh, we all remember the infamous Joe Judge press conference a couple of years back when the Eagles rested their starters. Now, Brian Dayball, the Giants clinched uh, a playoff spot. They're the sixth seed. Regardless, this game is meaningless to them. I know initially Brian Dayball's immediate reaction following the game, it indicated or sounded like that they might play the starters. We just had Paul Dettino from Giants.com on saying that uh, they might start the starters, but then eventually rest the starters. Dayball then came out yesterday and said, oh, you know, the the GM, Joe Shane, probably got to him. And his tune uh, definitely changed. He said, we'll do what's best for the football team. What does Martin Frank think the Giants will do here on Sunday? Martin Frank thinks the Giants will do what's best for their football team. And, you know, if they want to play Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones, you know, I can see that. Yeah, I can see them treating it like a preseason game get those guys in for like a series or two and then get them out of the game. Because I mean, you know, think about it. Like the only reason the giants are as good as they are is because of Saquon Barkley and, and Daniel Jones. So, you know, why risk getting any of those guys hurt going in the playoff game? I mean, they're going to have to play a week later, regardless on the road, you know, quite possibly at San Francisco or Dallas. I mean, not Dallas, San Francisco or Minnesota. You know, you want to get those guys ready. So, you know, give them a few series to keep them sharp and then you get them get them out of the game. I mean, you know, the last thing Brian Dable or the Giants should be worried about is beating the Eagles. I mean, they got to worry about their own situation. They got to, you know, they want to be fully healthy going into the playoffs and, you know, keeping their guys sharp at the same time. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the Eagles were in the same situation last year. Um, You know, they clinched the playoff spot uh, against Washington, heading into the finale against Dallas. Um, They sat everybody. Um, Jalen Hurts didn't play, um, you know, and they got their butts kicked. But, you know, they had to play the next week on the road in Tampa. So they wanted to keep all those guys fresh. You know, Jalen Hurts at the time was dealing with an ankle injury. So, you know, he obviously needed the rest. They didn't play Miles Sanders. They didn't play uh, – they didn't play a bunch of guys. Uh, and, you know, that's how they have to approach it. you got to do what's best for your team. And for the Giants, the best thing for their team is making sure they're healthy in the playoffs, not whether or not they beat the Eagles. Yeah, and suddenly if they do get the Vikings there in the first round, that's a very winnable game for Big Blue. They might be uh, advancing. Yeah. In, in the tournament and uh i know you you've got to get out of here uh we're talking, talking to martin frank delaware news journal appreciate the time what is coming on deck content wise over at the paper online twitter uh give us everything you got coming this time martin. all right well um tomorrow tomorrow morning I'm, I'm gonna have something on looking back at like uh the eagles regular season finale games and just how how different like they've all been. I mean, there were a couple years where they had to beat Dallas in order to get in the playoffs, um, you know, going back like 12, 14 years. You know, there was a game two years ago, obviously, when the Sudfeld game, you know, there was a game last year. Just It just kind of been fascinating looking at like all those um, season finales and how they've meant like so many different things for the Eagles and taken on a whole new meaning besides just a regular season finale. So, uh, I was going to look at that. Um, I'm also going to do something on, uh, you know, a lot of people um, kind of forget like the contributions that Linval Joseph and Damakong Su have made, you know, since they, you know, decided to sign on in late November and, you know, how that's affected Jordan Davis and everything else. So, you know, that's another story that I'm working on and, you know, we'll just see what happens after that. You know, it'll be some interesting stuff. I think Linville Joseph is playing his way back onto 
the roster next season. So that'll be an interesting yeah, off-season topic, right? And, uh, you know, we look forward to having you back, hopefully, come postseason time. And, uh, you know, the Eagles are going to look to clinch that number one seed. Stay safe out there. It sounds like they're revving the – they got uh, drag racing outside <laughs> the window there. <laughs> no, they're, I think they're trying to get the fields ready for practice tomorrow <laughs> or something. I'm at the facility and everything, and they got the, uh, you know, gardening and stuff, doing all that kind of lawn work. Fair enough. Well, thank you for hanging with us a little overtime here. There was a lot to unpack. Greatly appreciate the time, and uh, we'll be looking out for all that great content you have on deck. All right. Thanks for having me, Rick. Take care. All right. There he goes. My favorite, Martin. Martin Frank, Delaware News Journal, a regular here on the Football Playbook, always does a great job with us. So, hey, uh, you just got the Eagles perspective. You first segment got the Giants perspective. And we're going to take a quick break. When you come back, you're going to get the RIC perspective. I was down there soaking it all in at the link, the tailgate takeover. We'll talk about that. Uh, Sixer, 559. I saw you in the chat room earlier. I know your real name now. Uh, Doc was out there. Uh, we had all the listeners, Dawn. Uh, some of you guys did not show up. Oh, Cam's Razor, man. I had the... Uh, the Lagunitis was there chilling for you, brother. Uh, I had it. Where were you at? We'll get into uh, the tailgate takeover, the 90s music outside the window. I'm always a big fan of that. And, uh, yeah, you know, maybe there's a court date around the corner for the kid. I got, I, I shaved the uh, gruff off. I figured, hey, the playoff beard was, wasn't was doing us any luck. We were 0-2 <laughs> with the playoff beard. So I said, new year, time for a change. Let's try something different. And uh, Philiopolis, we're going to address whether I think the Eagles will seal the deal with the number one seed. We'll get into um, other thoughts that I have in terms of the arrogance or the naive of this coaching staff. Uh, Nick Sariani, is he calling the plays? Because he said something in his press conference that uh, – Raise the antennas on what's really transpiring behind closed doors where Martin Frank just checked in over at the NovaCare complex. Man, buckle up. We're just getting started. It's an hour of power down, an hour of power still to go. Make sure you smash that like button while you're there. We'll be back right after this. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Number one, Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown is rolling back prices for a December to remember. For a limited time, you can own, not lease, brand new 2023 Jeep Wranglers for only $39.95 or $339 per month. New Rams starting at only $39.95 or new Rams 1500 Bighorn Crew Cabs $189 per month. Zero down can deliver. Get the price you want, the selection you need, and the VIP treatment you deserve. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, big finish sales event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. 
But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. With Seth Joyner. I knew that they had a running game. Derek Gunn. He has put in the effort. Devin Caney. Had we not won the Super Bowl, what would we be saying? And Mike Missanelli. Well, you know how Philly is. Post game, now streaming on the 6ABC family of apps. Back at it again, TFP with RIC. It's the football playbook brought to you by Ocean Casino Resorts. Make sure you smash the like button. We're just getting started. An hour of power down, an hour of power to go. Uh, Roll call time in the chat room. I see all my chat room people. It was good to mingle with you guys down at the tailgate takeover. I'll get to that later on in the show. Uh, I want to recap some of the Saints game. I want to preview some of the Giants uh, matchup. As the Eagles look to clinch the number one seed, hey, the good news is on this Tuesday, January third, Eagles still control their own destiny. You go seal the deal. You win, and the path to the playoffs in the NFC runs through Philadelphia. You got to go out there, take care of business. In a way, it might be a good thing that Jalen Hurts plays this week. Otherwise, it would have been five weeks on the sideline. You know, do you really want to trot him out there wondering how that first hit's going to feel? So I don't think it's the worst thing. We'll get into it more. We'll break it all down. Uh, We do have an update on Damar Hamlin. His marketing representative, Jordan Rooney, I guess, appeared on ABC's Good Morning America a few minutes ago. And the latest update that we can report here on the football playbook is that His marketing representative, Jordan Rooney, said, I can't speak specifically on his medical condition, which we heard at last update was that he's in stable condition. Uh, I will say that he's fighting. He's a fighter. The family's in good spirits. And we're honestly just taking it minute by minute, hour by hour. And again, uh, we continue to hope for the best. Damar Hamlin's mom at the game, you saw pregame, hanging out with the family down on the field. Little did she know she'd be sharing the ambulance ride over to the University of Cincinnati uh, Medical Center. And so, you know, we'll continue to monitor the situation. Uh, In terms of the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, I'll recap the Saints, then I'll get into the Giants. Uh, In terms of the Saints game, you know, there's so much here. And I want to spend a minute, a minute or two, to give the the Saints their due, because I sat here, and what a great post-game show, by the way. If you haven't checked out the Pondland Hockey pre- and post-game presented by Ocean Casino Resorts each and every Eagles game, uh, great crew, great staff. Uh, However, I, I, I feel like, you know, still, there's a lot of you out there that think the Saints team stinks. I, I didn't see it that way. I saw a team in here that was mathematically alive for the playoffs, fighting for their lives, okay? Remember, a team that had playoff aspirations, and if you listen to Dennis Allen, he had Super Bowl aspirations. Oh, by the way, they got back Chris Olave, who was out for a couple weeks with a hamstring. Uh, I think he leads all rookies in receiving, pretty good player. Marshawn Latimer, you saw the interception there, which, by the way, A.J. Brown basically threw Gardner Menchu under the bus on that one. And then, you know, 
Nick Sariani was asked about that in his press conference, and he said, yo, he said, no, that's on me. He said, I take responsibility for that call. And I got to wonder, he said it was bad. He said it was a bad play call by us. They made a play, and I take full responsibility for it. Well, did you call the play then, coach? Who's who's exactly calling the plays? Why are you taking full responsibility? A little bit weird. A lot of question marks, especially on the offense. Uh, I know the defense, Jonathan Gannon, he's not going to change. But it was disappointing. It was disappointing to see um, the offense not ad adapt. And then Gardner Menchu, he might have been speaking about this interception, but he did say, he came out and said post game, said the Saints were sitting on some of our stuff. Said that I, it seemed like the Saints were sitting on some of our stuff. That's what Gardner said post game. And he tried to explain that there was a good game plan. We just didn't execute. I'm not buying it. That was a terrible game plan. To me, you've got a top five rusher in the NFL, and you only give him two touches in the first half with a backup quarterback after what I thought, you know, maybe Nick Sariani really believed Gardner Menchu played well against the Cowboys. That's what he told us. That's what Shane Steichen told us. That's what all of you in the chat room told us. I didn't see it that way. I thought Gardner Menchu played a mediocre game against the Cowboys, and he turned the ball over quite a bit. Six turnovers in two games by one individual. Menchu mania. <laughs> you could take that somewhere else. So the Saints were kind of sitting on some of their stuff, according to Gardner Menchu. Nick Sariani wants to take responsibility for the play calling. Really? Interesting. But – we talked about it last week, guys. I told you, Taysom Hill, we don't know if he's coming or going. Two weeks ago, he didn't even touch the ball in the first half. Against the Eagles, I think he was in there on like the second play of the game. They tried it out, Taysom Hill. And that's the thing. We talked about it. Like, there's an adjustment period. You can you can game plan for that all week in practice. But until you actually get there out on the field and have to account for that, it's a different, it's a different deal. Alvin Kamara. You know, we talked about it like we slept on the ability that the Saints have to make plays. Alvin Kamara can still make a play or two. Rashid Shahid, for those of you who pay attention to the rest of the league like I do, I told you, there has not been a better slot receiver, few if any, over the last month of the regular season than Rashid Shahid. And he showed up in a big way. He was a problem. The zone... Defense cannot cover these guys. And so <laughs> Jawan Johnson, we talked about it, right? He made some plays. I love the fact that they have a fullback, Adam Prentice, right? You don't see that too much. They were playing some smash mouth football and the Eagles couldn't man up and stop it. And Jordan Cameron, I mean, three sacks on the day, he took full advantage of the situation. We mentioned Caden Ellis all week long. Guy was playing with his hair on fire. And we had Kyle T. Mosley on last week that told you about Carl Granderson and how he's kind of emerged as a pass rusher on that defensive line. So, like, everything we told you last week when you guys were sitting here telling me I'm crazy, it kind of all came true, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a perfect storm brewing, and the Eagles got punched in the nose. They didn't adapt and adjust. They didn't change anything. And they just expected to continue to do the same thing. Eagles need to really take a very uh, thorough self-reflection and look in the mirror. I see a lot of you guys are already talking about the draft. Guys. Can we get through the next 40 days? We got something special here. So I'll get to the Giants. I'll get to the Giants, guys. Uh, I want to cover the, some of the Saints stuff because, you know, the fact that they didn't establish Miles Sanders going into the playoffs, it tells me that the Eagles have 
little to no confidence in Miles Sanders. The ripple effect is Miles Sanders probably loses self-confidence. This is a guy, as you guys know, that needs to be coddled, that needs to have his ego massaged. And now, to me, you're you're showing Miles that you don't believe in him. So I think now he's already got a rattled insecurity with the fumbling issues. His confidence was wavering coming into that game. Now you show him that you have zero, zero confidence in his ability to carry this offense because that's exactly what the doctor ordered on Sunday. They needed Miles Sanders. They needed to establish or reestablish that running game, especially with Jalen Hurts not being able to run the ball. To me, you should have rode Miles Sanders and get some kind of momentum heading into the playoffs. And I get it. He might not be. I know he won't be back next year. But if you want to win a Super Bowl in the next 40 days, you need Miles Sanders. You do. The cadence, to me, this this Eagles offensive line, for as much credit as they get, they've gotten a pass now a couple weeks in a row. You know, they had the one game where they had a bunch of penalties with Jalen in there. The last two weeks have been poor, piss poor. And Stoutland better get it together. I don't know what they're going to do at the tackle position. Lane Johnson, I wouldn't put a lot of stock and what he's going to bring to the table come playoff time. I just wouldn't. You know, it bothered me that Menchu said that the Saints were sitting on stuff and they did not adjust anything in the second half, offensively or defensively. In fact, they Fletcher Cox was asked, point blank, Fletcher, what changed in the second half from a strategy game plan? Nothing. So we made zero adjustments. Now, the defense, they hunkered down in the second half and played played good. But, yeah, Jason Kelsey, Adams exploits. You're right. Maybe the worst game of his career. And I think that the Jason Kelsey reaction was how a lot of these Philadelphia Eagles players feel wholeheartedly. Um, you know, he said, I, didn't give, I don't give a shit about clinching. Uh, was disappointed, pissed off. The false starts is a collection of us not being locked in. Kelsey continued, not a lot of reps with Gardner Menchu. <laughs> That's bullshit. Uh, we're professionals. I'm not focused on clinching. I could give two shits about the one seed. We got a lot to correct. Always going to give the defense credit. We had multiple things that we didn't do well. He said, it starts with me. Penalties destroyed us, and it starts with me, Jason Kelsey said. Not once, but twice, three times. Um, he said he felt like they had a good week of practice. They just didn't play their best ball. They weren't on the same page. We're going to fix things that are very fixable. We're going to have bad days. Unfortunately, this was a bad day. I don't want to make any excuses, but we put a lot of time into it. That's what hurt Kelsey, is he said the amount of time they put into the preparation. So he kind of contradicted himself because in one, he said we put so much time in with Gardner. In the first sentence, he said, oh, we didn't have a lot of snaps with Gardner. In the next sentence, he says we put so much time with Gardner. Um, he said Gardner played fine. I disagree with that. Just not good enough to win. In terms of Jalen Hurts, he said, you know, Jalen's a special guy. We have, uh, you know, more familiar with Jalen. And, you know, he, he, Kelsey, went to Gardner Menchu after the game. And he said he was sorry for all the mistakes and apologized. But, 
quite possibly the worst game we've ever seen from Jason Kelsey in his career. Um, going through, going through the uh, chat room comments. Hey, Kansu, some newbies, some Philliapolis, old school, new school, everything in between. We're here weekdays, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 Eastern. Uh, I know we get a lot of new listeners or viewers the day after the Eagles game. Um, you know, good point. Did the Josh Sweat injury knock the Eagles off a little bit? Possibly. Possibly. Um, you know, and listen, you can tell by Kelsey's comments, A.J. Brown's comments, they can't wait for Jalen Hurts to be back in the saddle. Okay. Now, I promised you, I promised you, um, I would give you my take on this upcoming Giants game. And I absolutely will do that. Uh, but first, we have to take commercial break, pay some bills. Josh Sills, by the way, a guy we had out at the NFL PA Bowl, somebody who I told you was going to make the Eagles 53 man roster back in August. He can play all five offensive line positions, did play some tackle there at Oklahoma State. Could this be a game? The New York Giants, that is, where we see Josh Sills in the mix. Or will it be Dillard? Or will we go back to Driscoll? I'll address all that. The New York football Giants. More takeaways from the Saints game. NFL Universe coming at you. It's the Football Playbook. Smash that like button. It's all brought to you by Ocean Casino Resorts. Your home for the Pondley Hockey Eagles pre and post game. We'll be back right after this. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to ocean. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, We've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Number one, Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown is rolling back prices for a December to remember. For a limited time, you can own, not lease, brand new 2023 Jeep Wranglers for only $39.95 or $339 per month. New Rams starting at only $39.95 or new Ram 1500 Bighorn Crew Cabs $189 per month. Zero down can deliver. Get the price you want, the selection you need, and the VIP treatment you deserve. Jeff D'Ambrosio, Destination Downingtown, big finish sales event. We all know that taxes are just part of life. It's true during our working years, but also in retirement. But what you might not know is up to 85% of your Social Security benefits might be taxed. Our team at Thrive Financial has helped retire thousands of people across the Delaware Valley by asking questions they never knew they needed to ask, including how their Social Security benefits might be taxed. It's time to be proactive on taxes. Get your Thrive Retirement Tax Playbook today. Seth Joyner. I knew that they had a running game. Derek Gunn. He has put in the effort. Devin Caney. Had we not won the Super Bowl, what would we be saying? And Mike Missanelli. Well, you know how Philly is. Post game, now streaming on the 6ABC family of apps.
Back at it again, TFP with RIC here at the Jersey Shore, breaking it down, chopping it up. This is episode 84 of the Football Playbook here on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. Uh, click subscribe, get all of our show notifications, smash that like button. We're here weekdays, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern time. We are 40 days away until the Super Bowl, 25 days away uh, till I check in. Out in Cali, Pasadena for the 11th annual NFL PA Collegiate Bowl. Uh, a lot of Eagles players have come through our event there. And then 114 days. You guys get me excited when I peek over to the chat room and you're talking draft prospects. Just wait until I hit you with the avalanche in the next 40 days. Once the Super Bowl is over, this is going to become NFL Draft Headquarters Central, baby. Uh, I've been covering the NFL draft myself personally for the last 21 years. Of course, uh, we are the official NFL draft content provider at Sports Illustrated. So check us out over there, si.com slash NFL slash draft. We've got over 700 scouting reports uh, for 2023 and beyond. So that's 40 days away until we get into the nitty gritty. But first off, we're on a mission here. The Philadelphia Eagles, 13 and three, taking on the New York football giants in what has become suddenly a meaningless game for Big Blue. And it was great to see a lot of you listeners at the tailgate takeover. We'll get to that at the end of the show. I think we have some pictures we're going to try to pop up. And what a, what a, uh, I feel like I'm now part of the Philadelphia sports scene community after that whole experience and the Eagles fans just really embracing. The football playbook, myself, uh, the compliments just mean so much to me. It really does. And uh, that's why we do it. <laughs> Not for, you know, the Buffalo nickels that show up in the mail. There you go. Shout out to Gail Saunders, by the way, who just did an incredible job setting this party up. And Gail, man, was just crushing it out there. There's the doc who doesn't chime in in the chat room because he's uh, he's too busy pulling teeth out there in Cherry Hill. And uh, he's probably got some poor son of a bitch Giants fan in his chair right now listening to the show. But it, all, all of his dentist patients have to sign a waiver from 10 to 12. They've got to be uh, tortured with the football playbook. That's Doc. And that's his wife, his beautiful wife, Dawn. There's Philly. There's Sixers 559 at the uh, tailgate takeover. There he is. And uh, he's working. I found out that he could only tune into the first half hour of the show. And then he comes back and watches the archives because um, the the so we'll the no, let's move that one out of there. Sorry, that's my mistake. And so uh, we can't do the videos because of the music rights. And so uh, appreciate. Yeah, there, there you go. Put it up without the music. A little behind the scenes, though, from the tailgate takeover, the fourth and John experience. This is six years now they've been doing this. Uh, they had the DJ holding it down there. you got to look at the cheesesteaks were flowing. They had the peppers and onions with the cheesesteaks. The tomato pie was there. Uh, the Eagles fans and, and, and football playbook was out in full force. All the listeners there. Uh, so thank you for coming out, making that a wonderful experience. And uh, man, some of the compliments you guys paid me. Uh, hey, we, we were shotgunning the Bears. We don't have to wait till the end of the show. We'll do it in show. Uh, M. Reyes, <laughs> all good. And uh, man, I mean, again, the compliments, guys, is why we do this show. Um, it really means a lot to me. Uh, uh, Sixers 559 said, I'm a blessing to the Philadelphia sports scene. Wow. I mean, talk about knocking me off my feet. <laughs> Real talk. The podcast king, somebody called. I mean, unbelievable, the response. And also, I got to I gotta um, acknowledge the street cred that the Jacob sports YouTube channel has amongst the Eagles brethren. I mean, it was, it was really cool to see like the reaction once I told them about our show and Jacob sports and they heard of us and they tune in and they're locked in Jacob sports. They're so glad that we've come to the media forefront and, and what a refreshing change of pace from WIP and a lot of the other media coverage out there. Um, I can only speak for the football playbook. This is real talk, right? Uh, no fugazi here on the TFP with RIC. So thank you all for coming down 
And uh, I don't know. I'm questionable. I'm a 50-50 game time decision. I loved it so much. I might go back down and do it again this week, man. Uh, we will definitely be down, holding it down each and every week next year. I already spoke to Gail about TFP's involvement uh, with the fourth and John tailgate. It is world famous and truly the best kind of uh, experience <clears throat> that you could possibly have if you attend the Eagles game. So if you're if you're down there for the Giants game, parking lot G2, uh, you can't miss them. Look for the fourth and John flag, the DJ. Uh, we get this party started. And yes, we're going to talk a lot of draft, Phillyapolis. And I promise you the time has come where I'm going to talk about the Giants and my thoughts and my takeaways there. And again, if you're just tuning in, we had Paul Dettino, 40 years on the beat with the G-Men at the top of the show. You just heard from Martin Frank, Delaware News Journal. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the usual suspects. It's already hump day. Of course, we were off yesterday. We'll have Kayla Santiago and Glenn Irby back. And I think we have some um, Giants insider, the Biz. Uh, Chris Biz, I think, is going to join us as well. But uh, we'll continue to preview this Giants matchup, which I believe is going to be treated like a preseason finale in terms of Brian Dayball, uh, the starters, you know, Tyrod Taylor is a very capable quarterback now. Um, I'd put him in the Gardner Menchu category in terms of being a capable quarterback, uh, not a starting quarterback. I am not one of these guys who believes Gardner Menchu is one of the best 32. I think there's a big reason why he's only making $2.5 million uh, because nobody wanted to pay for his services. So I, I, I think that, you know, Tyrod Taylor is a serviceable guy now. He's won some games in this league. However, uh, all the starters are going to be resting, right? So this is a banged up Giants team. Saquon Barkley has, I don't know how many touches, probably over 300 touches. He's got over 16, 1700 all purpose yards, and he's got a lot of wear and tear. So Saquon Barkley could use a rest. Uh, that offensive line's all banged up. They got a lot of injuries on defense. And I think the Eagles are, are a two-touchdown favorite for very good reason. Uh, you're going to be going up against the B squad. So that brings me to, yes, the Eagles are going to win. The Eagles control their destiny. And they're going to win this game against the New York football giants. I firmly believe that. The question then becomes, at what point, do you consider pulling the starters at what juncture of the game? How many points do you need to be up by? Does Jalen play the whole game? Do you try to rest some starters? You know, it, 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 it's a funny thing because, like, the Eagles are faltering. They're playing their worst football at the most important time of the season, right? And you look around the NFC specifically – the 49ers, they faced some adversity this week. Jared Stidham, there was no film on this young man. And so the Raiders came out with this play action, whole different new offense, and the 49ers did adapt and adjust and pulled out the W, but it was a final, you know, stare adversity in the eye. They had to come back, fight from behind. Brock Purdy continues to light it up. The 49ers are red hot. I don't think there's a hotter team in the NFL than the San Francisco 49ers. If there is, it's the Green Bay Packers. And both of those teams are playing in the NFC. So the Eagles need to get it right and get it tight here. It's a 40-day season now. Throw everything out. Throw the last 16, 17 weeks out the window. It's a 40-day season. It starts today. Buckle up, okay? Tuesday, it's the players' day off. The coaches are in the building. They better get a game plan together. They better figure out who's calling the plays on offense. They better figure out how to play some man-to-man -man defense. <laughs> they better figure out a different plan of attack. Because I'll tell you what, they can get by this week with the same strategy, beating the New York football giants. They are not going to win football games come playoff time with the same strategy that they've used over the last 
I want to say several weeks, but the whole second half of the season, really, I saw Paul Mancini's comments like, yeah, they've lost two in a row, three out of five. But don't forget, the Colts game was disappointing. The Bears game didn't exactly play well. So suddenly, when you look back in the second half of the season, they really have been a tale of two two teams. The first half where they were injury-free, turnover-free, riding high, and then the second half where injuries and turnovers are starting to catch up and accumulate. I don't know what to expect yet from Jalen Hurts. This week will be a good indication. I do not believe it will be 100% back to the original game plan. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I just don't think you can run (laughs) Jalen Hurts 15 to 20 times a game anymore. Maybe you can. Maybe I'm wrong. Wouldn't be my strategy. Ooh, baby. Um, You know, the Giants, Brian Dayball, I know deep down in the belly, the fire that burns, Dayball wants to play the starters. I think Joe Shane will win the power struggle. And you could still see the Giants starters, possibly. You could see the Giants starters in the first quarter, maybe the first half. Maybe they want to stack up and see how far they've come. What did the Eagles beat them by, like 28 points? Something to that effect. Might be a good barometer heading into the playoffs. And I tell you, man, the Giants are locked into the sixth seed. They they might very well get the Minnesota Vikings in round one. Hey, the Giants could potentially be your first round opponent. We talk about... Cowboys, Eagles, round three feels inevitable. Could be Giants and Eagles, round three. But I think you got to empty out the tank. You can't play conservative. You can't save it for the playoffs. There's too much at stake. There's too much on the line. You've got to wrap up the number one seed. It's amazing that here we are, after the year that the Eagles just had, what did they win, the first 11, 12 games of the year? And now suddenly, they could tumble all the way to the fifth spot? Wow. That's a big difference in terms of outlook, in terms of momentum, in terms of capability. If you're the one seed, the path runs through Philadelphia. You have home field advantage. You have the fan element. You've got the Northeast weather factors into play, especially if a team like the 49ers or, yeah, Vikings are a cold weather team, but they play in a dome. It's a big advantage to have. Not only that, the first seed with the new playoff format is the only seed that gets a first round by. A lot easier deal when you just need to win two games. Winning one playoff game, as we found out last year, is very difficult to do. Winning two is even tougher. Winning three is damn near impossible because only one team a year is able to do that. So I do think that they get the W. Jalen will be out there. You know, listen, we mentioned it was a 10 to 14 day injury. And one last thing I'll say about the fact that everybody in the media knew Jalen Hurts wasn't playing. See, I'm not a beat writer, though. So I can come up here and tell you, hey, here's what I'm hearing. There's no blowback. There's no ramifications. If the Eagles PR department's watching, I got a message for him because they've been assholes to me over the last several years. But I'll tell you what, here's what bothers me. A lot of the media knew Jalen Hurts wasn't playing on Sunday. A lot of the media knew 
Jack Driscoll was going to be starting at right tackle, all of the media were scared to report any of it because there's this camaraderie between Nick Sariani and the Philadelphia media. And it bothers me. It irks me. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to harp on the Philadelphia media too much for this because I get it. They've got their hands tied behind their back because if they defy the friendship, if they defy the trust and report that, well, then they're not going to get any scoops moving forward. But to me, what Nick Sariani did compromises the integrity of the media. You're compromising the integrity of the media when you say, hey, Jack Driscoll is going to start, but please don't report it because we want to keep New Orleans guessing. That doesn't sit well with me. And I don't, I can't, I can't blame the media too much because guys like Johnny McMullen, who's on Birds 365 right before us, they're in between a rock and a hard place. What do you do when the head coach asks you not to report something? Well, go against his wishes and you will be cut off. You might have your press credential revoked. You might not get access to interviews. Putting the media in a tough deal, man. It's not fair to the fans. It's not fair to the sport. It's not fair to the professionals. It's not fair to anybody. It's not right. Doesn't sit well with me. And quite frankly, the Pro Football Writers Association might want to look into that. So, I don't know. I knew Jalen Hurts wasn't starting. There's not going to be any blowback here. I could care less about the Eagles' PR, their press passes, or how they conduct their business. Because guess what? Once the season's over, we're going to have Eagles players on all day. Go right around their PR communications department. Go right through. I'm going to book guests right through the agents. And the players are going to come on. They're going to chop it up. They're going to talk. They're going to be transparent. And we're going to get our interview access and our scoops here in our own way. I don't need the Eagles for nothing. And they've been they've been doing these shenanigans with the media for quite some time now. And it's not right. They really fooled them, right? Oh, Jack, Dr- Jack Driscoll starting. Every- Man, Coach Sariani, you really fooled them, Gipper. Give me a break. Is that is that why? The Eagles are scared, like, you scared to, like, talk about who you are, what you're going to be about? Bro, good teams, they tell you what you're going to, they tell you what they're going to do, you know what's coming, and they do it anyway. That's the sign of a good team. Kevin Savard says, Rick, most of the fans here knew that Jalen wasn't playing. Not when I hit, not when I did the show on Friday and I told you he wasn't playing, you guys roasted me. <laughs> you, you guys were not really uh, confident about it. So maybe the chat room here had a different finger on the pulse. But on Friday, when I told you Jalen wasn't playing, there was a lot of you questioning me and thinking that Jalen Hurts had a shot to play. So I don't know. I mean, I heard the media talking about Jalen Hurts is out there. He's practicing. Oh, we don't know. I heard a lot of it. So maybe we were listening to different media outlets. <laughs> Philiopolis, hey, man, like I said, I'm not going to come up here and just fabricate stuff and talk out the side of my neck. I'm trying to be transparent with it and give you guys some honest analysis and reporting. Just like I came on here and told you when everybody was Putting Gardner Menchu up on a pedestal. Oh man, he's so good. I said, I, I don't see it, guys. I, 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 are we watching a different game? I, you know, I try to keep it real with you guys. That's what we do here in the football playbook. Buckle up. 
<laughs> it's a double chin strap affair. I'm getting down uh, to the nitty gritty of the show here. You know, um, I got a lot of Eagles notes that I have not even gotten into. Um, We'll save them for tomorrow, I suppose. I will say, man, how about the college football playoffs, guys? Quickly here, a few minutes, shall we? On a scale from 1 to 10, how confident do I feel the Eagles win on Sunday, Philiopolis? Check back with me on Friday, but on Tuesday, today, I'm going to assume that the Giants starters play little to none. And if that's the case, I do believe the Eagles will win. I think they'll cover the 13 and a half points. So I'm going to put my confidence level at an 8.5. I feel very highly confident, 8.5 out of 10, that the Eagles take care of business and get the job done. If they don't, then, like Fletcher Cox said yesterday or the other day, nobody's up here hitting the panic button. I'll tell you what. Starters or not, you lose to the Giants this week, it's officially panic time. Kevin Savard says it's the play calling more than it was mentioned. Yeah. West Philly, BNR, yeah. Robert Jakuski, I agree. I think it's good that Hurts plays. Kick off some of the rust, find out. I don't want to be going into the, the first playoff game with Jalen Hurts out five weeks, wondering how that first hit is going to feel. Let's find it out right now. Take care of business. Get her done. Build the confidence back up. Let's go into the playoffs on a high note, on some positive momentum, because I got, I got news for you. They fall to the Giants, lose three in a row. This is going to look like that 11-0, uh, the Steelers, 11-0 couple years ago one and done in the playoffs that'll be what this philadelphia team does if they lose to the giants hearts on fire that's what i said this week if they run miles sanders it'll be all good but they don't do that they don't believe in miles sanders they don't have the confidence in miles sanders I do want to mention the college football playoffs because they were two riveting games. I was wrong. Uh, Philliopolis, I was wrong, dead wrong about Michigan winning the national championship. I might have been right about Jim Harbaugh taking the Broncos job because I hear I see that they've contacted him. But I was dead wrong about Michigan, which, by the way, I think they just got into a hole too early in that game against TCU to dig out of it. Michigan, to me, was the better team. Just early on, the calls didn't go their way. They fell in a hole. They battled back. The defense of Michigan, yeah, Doogie, show me how to Doogie. Max Dugan, uh, that TCU quarterback, he is a gamer, Paul Mancini. I agree. He's he's obviously limited. He's not going to be a day one, probably not even a day two pick. But somebody's going to roll the dice on him on day three. Absolutely. And I would anticipate – He's going to get a senior bowl invitation because he did announce that he's coming out for this year's draft. And how about my guy, DeMarcado? I told you guys, Kentrell Miller went down in that game due to injury, the starting running back for TCU. DeMarcado came in, ripped it up. I think he had 136 rushing yards. We're going to have him out at the NFL PA Collegiate Bowl. We're excited about that. Um. Yeah, Harbaugh has already been contacted by Denver, uh, has reached out to him. So the wheels are in motion there. You know, um, I, I thought Michigan had the ammunition to do it. They did not. Um, I did have some other notes on that game. But the other one, how about the New Year's? What a way to ring it in. Literally, Ohio State lining up for the game-winning field goal as the countdown to the new year is beginning. I mean, literally 30 seconds here on the East coast until the strike of midnight and Ohio state's lining up for the game winning field goal. Uh, 
wh- who was it? Ruggles? Riggles? Hooks it. Last second. And I'll tell you what, I think somebody made a good point. CJ Stroud should thank the kicker because that was a hell of a performance. I think all he did was solidify his case to be the number one overall pick. Incredible game against the 33rd NFL defense, the Georgia Bulldogs. And now he can hang his hat on that performance. I think CJ Stroud is going to be your number one overall pick. Hearts on fire. Quentin Johnson, man, we had a great preview last week with Dane Vandernat. I said, this guy's got a little uh, Calvin Johnson residue to his game, man. He's athletic. He's tall. He's electrifying. I like me some Quentin Johnson. Will he be the number one receiver off the board? Could be. Could be. Sonny Dykes, yeah, hell of a job there with TCU. And uh, Georgia's going into this thing as a two-touchdown favorite. I don't know. Watch out. TCU, man, I underestimated them once. I don't think I'll do it again. Uh, I did see, by the way, uh, Alabama, Kansas State also played on Saturday. Bryce Young, Will Anderson, and the running back all declared for the draft. So um, we'll talk more about that as the week continues. Yeah, Chris Sims. Yo, Dank, I saw that. Chris Sims is crying out there like a little bitch. I invited him onto this show. He wants ESPN to invite him onto Sports Center. But Chris, you got hey. We'll roll out the green carpet for you, Chris. Chrissy. <laughs> you want to come and talk some real ball? I mean, I love your father. You not so much. Uh Stetson Bennett is draft eligible, Hearts of Fire. He'll actually, he's got an invitation to the NFL PA Collegiate Bowl on January 28th, which will be televised on NFL Network 6 p.m. We have not heard back from him yet. I think he wants to finish out the season. Unfortunately, he's like 190 pounds soaking wet, so he'll never last in the NFL. I don't I don't know if teams will even roll the dice on him, but I do think he could be a very elite player north of the border in the CFL. That's Stetson Bennett. All right, well, hey, we're out of time. I can't believe it. It's been another uh, two hours of power here on the Football Playbook. Thank you so much for tuning in. Smash that like button one more time. Click subscribe. And uh, coming up next here at noon Eastern is Sports Take on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. We'll try to do better the next time. Dane Vandernat uh, on Thursday, Kayla Santiago, Glenn Irby, and Chris Biz from Giants Insider tomorrow. Buckle up. Big shout out to Tone DeShields the second, the super producer, Always doing a great job here. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit.